today. My name is Jeroen de Wolf. I'm the director of the UC Berkeley Institute of European Studies, and I would like to welcome all of you to today's event on forest management, development of fire prevention and firefighting strategies uh, for a conversation on how wildfires and, and combating strategies to combat wildfires um, in, 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 in the United States and, and to speak about this in dialogue with European Union policies uh, in this uh, field. Now, forest management um, happens to be also a priority of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union and it is taking place now during the first semester of 2021. And this explains why today's event is organized by our Center for Portuguese Studies in cooperation with the Consulate General of Portugal in San Francisco and our partner organization in Portugal, the Luso American Development Foundation. Today's event will be moderated by my colleagues uh, Duarte Pinheiro and Diolinda Adão from our Center for Portuguese Studies. And we welcome three distinguished uh, speakers. Um, I would like to uh, welcome my colleague, uh, Keith Gillis, professor in forest economics here from UC Berkeley. Uh, we also welcome to the program João Miguel Cardoso Pereira, Pereira um, who studied uh, in the United States, obtained a PhD degree in renewable natural resource studies from the University of Arizona, and who currently is a professor at the School of Agriculture at the University of Lisbon. And Professor Pereira is currently experiencing some technical difficulties, so we hope that he will still be able to join us uh, for the conversation. The third speaker is uh, Enrique Pereira dos Santos, uh, who studied landscape architecture and did much of his work in the area of biodiversity and currently is the director of the Association for Nature Conservation, an environmental NGO. Um, so a warm welcome um, to all of you and thank you for taking the time to join us uh, today. The way things will work is that my colleagues Duarte and Diolinda will moderate uh, the discussion, but people in the audience can also pass on questions via the chat room. So during the conversation, you're all encouraged uh, to write down your own question in the chat function on Zoom, and my colleagues will then uh, pass on a selection of these questions um, in the second part of the conversation. I do want to ask people in the audience to please mute yourself um, during the event and to also turn off uh, your personal videos. Allow me now um, to pass on the floor um, to my colleague, uh, Diolinda, um, to start today's uh, conversation. Uh, Diolinda, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope I've unmuted myself. I think I have. Uh, welcome to all to this um, wonderful event that we have been wanting to do for a while, but uh, COVID and retirements and time differences and all these other things combined have made us postpone it to now. But this is not only a very important subject, uh, it is also one of the objectives of, uh, or one of the main objectives of the, the presidency of, of Portugal in the, of the Euro European Union. It has been a long time project uh, that actually Professor Gillis has collaborated in for, for a while now, many years back, we've um, talked about these things. Uh, so I actually would uh, like to, uh, you all have the bios of our guests and in order to accommodate time and have us have content for as long as possible, um, I would cut my introductions very, very short. Uh, Professor Gillis has uh, been uh, the Dean for Forest Management in the Forestry Department, in addition to uncountable number of publications, research projects. Uh, he is one of the foremost authorities on Mediterranean climate forests. We're very grateful to have him with us. And I'm only introducing him because Professor Cardoso Pereira is still not with us, so I will wait uh, just to, to do his introductions at that point. And Professor Gillis, I think um, uh, I would start with you. Uh, and I would ask you, 
Is there any particular thing that um, best describes or the specificities of California and Portuguese forests? Um, what would those be, if there are any? Uh, well, the similarities are uncanny. And as I was saying before you logged on, De Alinda, uh, my colleagues and I, when we're in Portugal, we, we just squint a little bit and we feel like we haven't left California. The, the landscapes are so similar. Um, and I think partly our, our current increasing vulnerability is very similar in that under climate change, the lengthening of the fire season and the frequency of extreme weather events, you know, the, the kind of high temperature, low relative humidity, high wind speed events that are so problematic to control, um, put us in the same suppression problem, uh, but we can't solve the suppression problem. So we're both alike in that what has to happen is in the prevention side, because we're never going to catch up the way the climate is changing as if we treat this as a suppression problem. You're muted, Delinda. Sorry. Uh, I see that Professor Miguel Pereira has joined us. Uh, I'm glad to have you with us. We, we can't hear you. You must unmute. Uh -huh. I'm not quite sure how I finally end up ended up joining you, but I'm here. We never are, and I, I'm not sure you you watch this in Portugal, but uh, I am of an age that I remember a game show when I was younger called Hollywood Squares, and they always had, a, you know, a little goof ups, and I feel that's what we are. We're all playing Hollywood Squares right now, except there are no prizes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. welcome to our Hollywood Square session. Thank you very much. Thank and, you very uh, much. And as um, I was mentioning, uh, my small introduction is that Professor Jean Miguel Pereira is a professor of forestry management at the University of Lisbon and is, again, one of the foremost authorities in the area in Portugal. So we're extremely privileged to have um, these uh, two uh, very, very expert experts uh, with all the uh, superlatives that we could possibly have because um, their discussion is, is going to bring us much needed information. We are also welcoming to the discussion Dr. Enrique Sanchez Pereira, who is, uh, as I, he's probably has other attributes, but what brings him to this forum is that he is a long time interventionist in, in forest management from a, a grassroots perspective. He is the founder of a Portuguese uh, nonprofit organization called Montish, who dedicate, that dedicates themselves to the renewal of the forest, to replantation, to, to reestablishment of the traditional Mediterranean forest uh, in order to create barriers for these uh, uncontrollable wildfires. So I will take, I will ask Mr. Uh, Professor uh, Pereira a little bit of what I asked uh, of Professor Gillis, but I will add an addendum. Given the similarities that Professor Gillis has already expressed in regards to the DNA of Portuguese and California forests, um, it, it, one thing that seems to be a little bit different is the amount of forest that is public land and the amount of forest that is private land. Um, and I would like you to discuss that a little bit, the, the, how that plays into the management structure. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, hi, Keith. Long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, yes, that's, that is a, a critically important uh, difference. And uh, because uh, in, in Portugal, the forest area that um, is under uh, public management, management by a central government agency, is a few percent, is something like 3% of the total forest area. 
then there is another small parcel, some five or six percent that are um, local community lands, but uh, over 90 percent of the land is privately owned. And the landowner, the land parcel size, the, 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 the uh, most parcels are very, very small. And so that creates a particular set of, uh, of, of difficulties, uh, of idiosyncrasies for attempting to manage the land at the scale that is required to, uh, to, uh, to address this problem. Um, may I have like five minutes to show a couple of slides to try and uh, uh, introduce the, the, the to, to frame the way I look at the problem or is that not, not foreseen, not in the plans? It is in the plans. You can, I just made you host, co-host, so you can actually. May I share my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, you're in there in mute. Okay. Oh, Duarte will, will uh, uh, make you host so you can share your screen. Are you ready for that at now? Perfect. Okay, so are you are you seeing my screen now? We are, we are. Okay, so I, 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 I prepared this comparison of uh, these, these two time series of uh, the percent of the area of California and the percent of the area of Portugal that have burned yearly since 1987, which is when I found the uh, um, data from the, from the US for, for the state of California. And so you see that um, in, in 2020, California had a really extreme uh, peak fire season, but in percent terms, uh, we, we have had even worse um, fire seasons. I think the, the, average, uh, the average percent of the area of California that burns annually is like 0.7% and in Portugal is 1.4%. So fire incidents in Portugal is almost exactly twice as high as in California. Uh, this is a, a map that my, my team has been working on for a very long time. And it shows the number of times that each hectare in Portugal burned since 1975. Uh, up to 2018. And so you see that um, especially the northern half of the country has been affected. And we have very different fire situations over here in the northern third of the country and here in the central part of the country and in the south. And one thing that it is critically important to take into account is that fires in Portugal are not by any means strictly a forest problem. Um, they are a, a, an issue of, of rural lands and we are gradually not talking about forest fires anymore, but talking about rural fires. And, and this pie chart summarizes the, those statistics. And you see that in, 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 the, in the very long run, it's not this whole period, but it's for another, for a 30 year period, half of the area burned is shrublands and pastures. And forests account for only one third of the area burned in Portugal, and the other almost 20% is agricultural areas that are kind of uh, um, are kind of casualties of this other process. But so uh, forests uh, account for one third of the area burned in Portugal in the in the long run. So we're really dealing with a with a with a rural problem, and I've recently been involved in, uh, with, in, in uh, collaboration with landowners from, uh, from a parish in central Portugal. Uh, it has an area of 10,000 hectares, so that's about 25,000 acres, and 60% of the parish burned in a large fire in June 
2017. So I'm going to use this uh, as, as, as a case study, as an example that is representative of all of this area in the center of the country, where we really do have a serious wildfire, forest fire problem. So um, the area is under severe uh, land abandonment and rural depopulation. It has lost 75% of its population since the 1960s. And uh, over half of the population is 65 years old or, or older. So they're really losing people and the ones that remain on the land are getting older and older. Quickly take a look at the changes in land use. Um, forests in green, shrublands and pastures in gray, and croplands in this salmon kind of color. So barely, very little forest in 1910. By 1960, about half of the area was forest. By 2015, 93% of the area was forest. So as the population started leaving the area, there was this massive land use change because there was no longer a labor force available for very labor intensive forms of land use. And so the solution was very extensive afforestation of these areas. So in one, in one century, the forest land cover went from six or 7% to 92 or 93%. And this is the consequence. Now you see the parish in the center of the screen uh, and an area of 50 by 50 kilometers around it. And you see the annual area burned um, to, to show over the last 40 years, the, the entire area of the parish or the equivalent to the entire area of the parish burned twice over the last 40 years years. And so you see, this is, this is typical, this is representative of, of central Portugal. And um, yeah, that was 2017. So this is the type of, this is the type of, uh, of, uh, of I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. So this is the type of, of, of fire, of wildfire syndrome we have in our more densely forested areas. Um, land abandonment, rapid land use change, uh, an expansion in forest area. Uh, that area of 25,000 acres has 3,000 3, landowners, 3,000 different landowners, and each parcel size is 1.5 acres is the mean, the, the average land parcel size. So this poses very specific problems because we, we have in this area, we have often fires of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 hectares. So to address, like, like I, when, I ent when I entered the meeting, when I joined the meeting, uh, Keith was saying that um, we, can, we cannot address this as a suppression issue. We have to, to, to address it as a fire prevention and as a land management issue. The problem we have here is that we're, fa we're facing uh, fires that can be several thousand hectares in size and dealing with private, autonomous, independent landowners, each one of which has a parcel 1.5 acres in size, and there are thousands of them. So it's not only managing fuels like you can do if the land is primarily public and managed by a single agency or a small number of agencies. Here, I think what we have, what we are doing with these people is trying to, to, to develop uh, mechanisms for them to, to start collaborating and, and coordinating land management at, at the scale that is relevant to address the magnitude of the fires they're usually exposed to. Wow, thank you so much. Um, now, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Henrique Santos, how, what, what 
where does Montes come in? How does it, what is, what is it trying to do to help alleviate this issue and to be a positive interventionist towards a better management of the forest? I, um, if I can, I, I can also share my, 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 my screen uh, a little bit, only for five slides or something like that. It's okay now. You can yes. see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what what we 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 do? We, um, first thing we 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 have in mind. Um, so sorry. Yes. Okay. First thing we we have in mind. Um, fire is not a uh, is not something that could happen. We 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 start thinking that um, fire is certain. We cannot avoid it. So uh, let's look at this. Uh, you see a lonely oak here, uh, but this is uh, brooms, um, three, four, five meters uh, of brooms. There's no way to, to, to think that it will not burn. It will burn. That, that is our point of view. Uh, so before it burns, uh, whenever we don't want, uh, the way we don't want, in, in the time we don't want, we started to say, well, let's use fire in our favor, not against us. So we, we, we make some, some, some uh, prescribed fire uh, in order to, um, to have some opportunities to, to manage. Because in this side, this, this, this uh, doesn't burn yet. It's, it's always yet. But we cannot enter here to, to manage anything. But here we can. We made a fire here. It, this is half the fire, and so we can we can bring people and we can discuss solutions, solutions and and, and management actions, in order to uh, join people. We don't plant too much. Uh, in fact, we don't plant too much. We we try to 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 help uh, the natural natural regeneration of vegetation. Uh, but sometimes we, we also plant, like, like in this time. But the main idea is, is that um, fire, it's not a question of, of um, natural, uh, it's not a question of, of, of a technical thing, it's a question of people. The, the main thing for us, I will stop to do this because I don't, I don't want, to, it's, it's not needed. So our idea is, first, we cannot avoid, avoid fire. Second, it's a question of people. And we must bring people to this, and we must bring, bring uh, management to this. The point is, uh, if we were a pulp company, for example, we can plant eucalyptus, manage, uh, manage forest fuels, and take some money uh, from that. But apart from the, from from that, we most of the of the management, uh, and of course, if it's made for conservation purpose like ours, we cannot take any um, any return financial return from that management. So we have to collect uh, resources outside the problem, and bring the resources to the problem. And the problem is how to manage this in order to achieve a better social thing uh, s s sometime in the future. But knowing that fire, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a friend we have to, to deal with. It's a friend that has have some uh, difficulties, but, but it's a friend of us. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to fight it. We just want to uh, cooperate with him and, and, and bring him to, to the, the, the management um, model that we have in, our, in all our properties. The, the first time we, we go for a property that we uh, buy or take for, for, for management, the first thing we say is, well, we have time until the next fire, what we can do that is not destroyed by the fire. We, what we can do to, to to uh, to put the things running in the way we want until the next fire that is not destroyed by the fire. 
it's one of the reasons we don't plant too much because most of the plantations will be destroyed by the next fire. So let's let's work in another way. Um, regeneration soil, uh, conducting water, uh, looking to the seeds and for the, the seed bank and all, that, all those kind of things that cannot be destroyed uh, in the next fire because we, have, we will have a, a next fire. Thank you so much. Uh, what you've all said bring up a whole set of questions, but it's, uh, I would like to invite my colleague Duarte Pinheiro to, mm -hmm. to continue with the discussion for now. So, what? Thank you, Vilinda. So the second question um, is actually about the policies um, of forest management. And I would invite, let's keep the same order perhaps with Professor Gillis um, and the same question then for Professor Jean Miguel Carlos Pereira. So political and governmental entities in Portugal and California have repeatedly announced new policies of forest management. In many cases, that involves reevaluating forest administration funding for private and public land uh, reforestation projects. Can you describe some of these policies? How are they being carried out? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, one of the complexities that we have in California is we do have a lot of public land, but we also have a lot of private land. And so we have two completely different competing regulatory environments. Uh, we have lots of federal land, uh, which uh, proceeds under uh, federal appropriations on its management. Uh, and we have state lands. Um, and the two, the, the federal lands are managed under something called the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Uh, and it's a very rigorous standard for action. Uh, and the Forest Service, for instance, or the Park Service or the Bureau of Land Management <clears throat> have to approve all their actions under that, that guidance. Whereas in California, we have a parallel act, but we also very significantly have a lot of local control. Uh, and for and this, we're, we're talking about about 20 million acres on either side of the fence there. Uh, on the private side, uh, we have the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection uh, appointed by the governor and I chair the, the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. And we write all the regulatory code that deals with fire safety, uh, the standards for roads, the standard for homes. And I'm actually involved at the moment in trying to revise those rules because the standards for things like roads or setbacks for buildings um, in fire prone areas that my board writes will start applying to high fire danger private lands uh, that are not, you know, unincorporated, sort of the things that are part of cities, uh, like in the spectacular fires. So we have these competing regulatory environments. And I think we're making more progress on the, the state side than on the federal side. But one of the initiatives is a memorandum of understanding uh, to exercise what you call in American legal terms, good neighbor authority, which lets one agency move across the boundary from state, state to federal or federal to state uh, and responsibilities and uh, combined fuel projects. We still have to deal with the fact that right, environmental compliance has to meet uh, the overarching environmental compliance law for the type of land, but we're working on it. And we have to do that because there's not a clear boundary in much of California between this side is federal, this side is state. It, the parcels are all intermixed, oddly enough, is a, a function of how the US government built railroads. It's a crazy thing, but our, our land ownership patterns look like a checker or chessboard, not uh, evenly bunched up things. So we are proceeding on both sides, um, but I also wanna say the regulatory environment and how you bring in local government is really complex here. And it occupies a lot of my time as a regulator um, because the fire environments, the way Jose put up a chart we have very wet forests, we have very dry forests, uh, we have oak savanna, and we have huge areas of brushland. 
And so especially Northern and Southern California could be completely different worlds. And even the fire regimes there, if you're trying to manage with fire, people are very nervous about the introduction of fire, which we want to do in some ecosystems, uh, in some coastal chaparral systems, the natural fire return interval is not every 10 years like it would be in the Sierra Nevada that's showing behind me. It might be every 50 years. And if you burn that stuff repeatedly, you actually destroy the ability of the brushlands to reproduce. And so coming up with ecologically nuanced things uh, where communities are satisfied that you're respecting both their safety and their ecology that's the institutional failure that we're trying to overcome. And it, it involves far more community engagement uh, than a lot of sort of technocratic American foresters are comfortable doing, whether in the forest mm -hmm. management or the fire service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jose Carlos Pereira, same question. So could you describe a little bit of these policies and how are they being carried out? I know the is as well as complex as in, in California, the Portuguese. Um, uh, yes, we are. We are. A, we are a, a small country, but uh, with 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 a good share of idiosyncrasies that uh, make for a, a, a quite complex problem. Uh, lots of things have been changing since 2017. In 2017, Portugal had its worst fire season on record. Over 5% of the area of the country burned, 119 people were killed. And so that really raised awareness to of both of the general public and of politicians to, a le to an unprecedented level. And, and I think the major effort uh, that, that kind of sets the background for the policy changes that are slowly um, being implemented, being designed and implemented, was precisely that reframing of the problem away from a civil protection problem and a fire suppression problem exclusively. Of course, it does have that dimension, but it was almost exclusively framed as a civil protection and a fire suppression problem. And to um, balance it out more with the uh, fire prevention dimension. And the fire prevention dimension in our specific context of a densely populated prob uh, country with over 5,000 years of people managing fire regimes uh, is essentially uh, framing the, 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 the issue as a rural land development problem. And, and that has already, that is already showing in the expenditures, in the annual budget uh, spent on fire management. From between 2000 and 2017, I would say, uh, the average annual expenditures were about 100 million euros and 70 to 80% of that was allocated to suppression. Uh, after the 2017 fires, the situation, the, 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 the budget has been um, shifting towards a more equal distribution. And in 2019, uh, the size of the budget increased 2.5 times. So it's, it was in 2019, was about 250 million euros, 50% for prevention and 50% for suppression. So that is a, a major change that, that redefines the problem and that, and that sets the stage for the, 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 the plan, the action plan that is currently under public discussion. Uh, I think the public discussion was initiated a couple of days ago and it has a, a few, uh, 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 three or I think four, what they call strategic orientations. And they are very much geared towards um, this uh, emphasizing of, of the, the, um, the rural land development dimension 
of, of the problem and, and in, in several aspects. Um, namely, uh, one, of the, one of the key objectives is to um, enhance the, the, the value of rural land by stimulating uh, a, a land market that has, is, is, is kind of dormant because among, of, of depopulation, uh, rural economic depression, um, the, the, the land market has been kind of dormant for a long time. And so one of the strategic objectives is to create an, an information infrastructure and deal with legal aspects like inheritance laws and fiscal law uh, that will kind of try to, to, to stimulate that, that land market, which hopefully will also lead to some change in the, in the, uh, in the size st structure of the parcel, some concentration of, 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 the, of the land in, in larger parcels, uh, so that more, more, more economic value is created by resource management and namely by forest management in these rural areas. Uh, another focus is uh, more directly or more direct uh, funding and intervention on uh, increasing the, 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 the intensity of management in forests and shrublands um, by creating um, programs to, to fund private landowners um, and, uh, and, to, um, and to create um, new um, um, units in the, in the forest service uh, with, with, uh, with trained for and with, with um, um, the role of engaging in, in, uh, in fuel management with mechanical means, with prescribed burning. Uh, there's also an, another aspect that uh, Enrique Pereira dos Santos is a great fan of, and, and I am too, which is to, to, to promote um, the use of um, herds of sheep and goats as, as uh, tools to, to control uh, to control the, the fuel growth, but so this dimension of um, improve or increasing the intensity of, of management is designed, is meant to, to focus on 1.2 million hectares that are considered strategically more important from the standpoint of fire danger. Uh, where uh, fuel management is supposed to be more, more, more frequent and, and more intensive. Also, uh, uh, another component of that is to ensure prompt intervention to rehabilitate burned areas larger than 500 hectares to try and make sure that to, they do not, after the fire, they're not abandoned because they've lost even more value and they just revert to a taller and denser brush than they were before the fire. Another dimension of this national action plan is to address people directly and try to um, understand and provide alternatives to fire use in an attempt to reduce the number of, of unwanted, unnecessary uh, ignition, ignition sources. So to educate fire users and to provide whenever possible alternatives to fire use and to improve, um, to improve um, surveillance mechanisms for, for rapid uh, detection. And finally, and possibly the, the, the most complex um, strategic objective, the one that has more projects associated with it, is, uh, is meant to improve the efficiency of for, for with which the fire risk is, is managed, uh, including better training for, for the personnel involved, um, the quantification of, of cost effectiveness of the fire suppression operations to, 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 in an attempt to improve um, the, the way that, that funding is spent. Um, focus on the minimization of, of risk 
so on on the on the damage on the loss and not so much on the total area burned so focus on the protection of the more valuable uh, assets so consider uh, the the exposure the value of the endangered assets and and so these are some of the key dimensions of this new uh, of this new action plan it is very much a top down kind of thing heavily backed by european funds and um, uh, it's it's questionable whether it will be sustainable in the wrong, in the long run and whether uh, we will be able to involve, to mobilize, to activate people, the landowners, many of whom are absentees, they no longer live in the, in the rural areas, so that uh, this is not a constant black hole for European funding that uh, never gets sustainable on its own, uh, which will only happen if if the uh, uh, if if the if if the economy the private economy is actually is actually activated and, and stimulated and if and if we have the, the stakeholders capable of 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 doing that and 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 uh, um, using these funds uh, as as kickoff but then not to depend on them for decades to come. Can I jump in real quick in front of Enrique on that? Because I want to pick up on something Jose just said. Um, I think uh, you touched on something that's really critical there. Partly it's it's just budget. How do you do it? You know, and the U.S. has done some reforms like that. Uh, suppression expenditures had risen to well over half of the U.S. Forest Service's budget, and they were crowding out all other program areas recreation, wildlife management. So mm -hmm. they just changed the budgeting method there. Sometimes it's more money. California has got a billion dollars more in the budget that's under consideration right now, specifically for fire prevention activities. But then you get into institutions about how you're gonna spend that and who will have the decision authority and where will those projects be in the landscape. But the most important thing that I think just came up was what are we trying to manage for? Mm -hmm. Right. And in California, fire protection started to protect timber. It's not really a timber protection measure anymore. And in fact, our forests are overstocked because we interpreted their fire ecology in terms of their productivity for timber, not the ecosystem the way it was really structured. And so we are faced with something interesting here that size of fires is not really the right metric for management. And mm -hmm. we are evolving new ideas as to what does it mean to be destructive as opposed to just large. We had always thought of destructive in terms of structures lost and in terms of deaths. And as, as Portugal knows only too well, deaths are always thought of uh, in the way we do fire statistics as an evacuation crisis that you know 90% of the deaths directly attributed to wildfires are in the evacuation process. Mm -hmm. But that's not true anymore, we're realizing. And yeah. if you look at our last fire season, uh, the number of excess deaths that were due to the particulate emissions of wildfires in our last fire season was probably two orders of magnitude higher than the deaths in those, those evacuations that went wrong. And so suddenly, air quality and management of greenhouse gases under things like the American Clean Air Act becomes forestry is late to the game. The assimilative capacity of the air for particulates is already portioned out between industry and transportation and power generation. And you're realizing that we have to manage the emissions as an even greater public health crisis than evacuation. And that involves forestry op or foresters like me operating way out of their comfort zone in terms of <laughs> how do you actually come up with social policy, which yeah. checks off all the boxes. Sorry for interrupting there. You, you, thank you so much for your intervention, both uh, 
Professor Gillis and Professor Zemeo Pereira. And time is running. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, another question to um, Dr. Enrique Sanchez Pereira. Um, my question has to do with policies and uh, public funding. Uh, what is Monte's role on the interventionist, uh, on this, in this interventionist context? Uh, by the way, as well, adding a second question, um, is Monte solely, solely privately funded by citizen donations or does it also receive public funding? Well, uh, we, we don't receive public funding uh, on, on a regular basis. Um, we know that money does, doesn't have color, so we receive money for uh, whenever you want to do it. Uh, but it's private fi fi financial. But, but let, let me say one thing about uh, the, 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 the two, two, two previous interventions. Um, in fact, uh, what, what, what is, could be a, a, an interesting idea is the, the idea of the helicopter money uh, on this, because it's not a question of fire, it's a question, it's a question of management. Um, so my idea is, uh, is simple, then, then, then you just pick uh, 100 uh, euros per hectare and just distribute, distribute it uh, to everyone who, who, run, who, who manage land. Uh, that is, uh, I don't care if it's with grazing or resin extraction or conservation purposes or um, hunting. What I, I don't care too much about that. Uh, I'm just, that avoids the question that uh, Professor uh, Gill said about what are we uh, managing for? I don't care. The, the, the owner knows uh, what 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 you, he wants to do, and I just fund it. Uh, fund the idea of, of 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 managing. That is the key question. To to bring management uh, for this. That's why uh, Zé Miguel uh, talked about my my um, obsession with grazing because it's a, a, a very efficient way. Montes uh, doesn't use grazing just because don't have don't have money. Um, in this time to do it, but sometimes we will um, uh, also uh, uh, pick up the, the grazing as a, a, in our toolbox for, for managing, ma management. I don't, uh, I, I'm certain about that because man, um, grazing, it's a very, very interesting thing. Um, you know that the, the, the difference between a medicine and, and a poison is, is the dose. Mm -hmm. So that is the question and, and we, we have to, to use it. But the, the question is uh, what, what we, sh we should do about fire. The question is what, what, how, how can we improve m management? That is the, the key question. How can we improve management? Because this is a management crisis, not a fire crisis. But uh, saying most, most of the people that uh, supports Montes is uh, private, uh, private people we don't we don't uh, receive unfortunately i would say uh, public money we would like to but uh, who knows the future what the future who knows who knows of course so we have so many questions so many interesting questions uh, in the chat uh, any of you can feel free to answer it but i'm going to try to summarize the two things that in, in one question, we're, as I said, as Duarte said, we're very short for time. So it seems like several of the questions are addressing the issue, two things that seem to be uh, pretty noticeable out here in, in the public uh, speech or sphere. One of them is the value of endemic species versus introduced species or imported species. Um, how, are, how can they play a role in forest management? And the second, um, it's some observations that both here and in Portugal, whenever there's a big fire, the first thing that seems to happen is the blaming game. It's that person's fault, is that institution's fault? And uh, how does that keep uh, get private owners and locals to be directly involved and take this, um, some responsibility for the management of the forest around them? So I don't know how you can blend these two, uh, but 
these seem to be the two things that uh, that are popping up more. I would invite any of you who have an answer to the questions that we can't possibly address them all in our time to offer that reply on chat. Uh, but I would like to each of you just address that uh, a little bit. So because most in mind people are having the, the paradise uh, situation where a town disappeared basically in a few hours and also the Pedragon Grant, which seems to be the two major catastrophes that stick to everybody's mm -hmm. mind. So with these two in mind and the whole endemic and important species, I'll start with Professor Gillis. Yeah, I was putting in a few answers that I took. <laughs> no. um, uh, invasive species can be an issue for us, but much less so in our forest lands than in our Southern California, uh, our shrublands, our chaparral lands. And of course, the, the thing which I know to say, no, our grasses are your grasses. <laughs> and that we managed to transform California from perennial grasses, uh, pre-European settlement, to Mediterranean species of annual grasses. And that mm -hmm. really exacerbates our fire vulnerability. So there is some restoration going there. In terms of trees, uh, the only real problem we have is uh, where houses are at risk, it's a matter of vegetation density much more than which species. Uh, you know, how much fuel are you loading into yeah. a landscape that's vulnerable? The exception is we went insane and planted millions and millions of eucalyptus uh, about the turn of the last century uh, in what was a big investment scandal. And so there are some big parts of California uh, covered in blue gum, which is quite flammable and worthless as a timber species. Um, and we are, are having some issues with places which should be oak savannas, but which are covered in dense eucalyptus forest. And those tend to be rather close to urban areas. So that's a problem. Uh, perhaps I can comment on also on this uh, issue of native species versus exotic imported species and their role on the fire situation in Portugal. Uh, there have been several quite thorough studies on, on uh, um, based on, on, on metaphorically on what are fire preferences for, for fires. What do fires um, prefer to consume? Do fires like to burn eucalypts more than pines or oaks or whatever? And, and it goes uh, very much, uh, I, I, it, it essentially agrees with, with what Keith was saying um, about that um, the, 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 the nature of the species is secondary relatively to the forest management and the amount of fuels that um, we allow to accumulate in the understory of the forest. And, and for example, uh, our, our two main um, forest species, I, I, I'm not talking about the southern oak woodlands and the cork oak woodlands, I'm talking about uh, eucalypts and pines. The maritime pine is a native species. Uh, blue gum, eucalyptus globulus, is imported from Tasmania. They're both quite flammable. Uh, they're That's both. Right. I should say, I'm disparaging eucalyptus because we have no paper mills or pulp mills in the state. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, it has no have... value to us. Yeah, yeah, that, that's not the case for us. But what, what's, a, what's an interesting difference is that from the, the, the inherent flammability perspective, what we call the fire autoecology, they're both quite flammable, they're both quite problematic. But what we end up seeing is that the incidence of fire is substantially higher in pine 
plantations than in eucalypt plantations. And it has got very little to do with the ecology of the species. It has everything to do with the economics of the, of, of, the, of the use of both species. Eucalypt plantations are more valuable, so generate more income, and there is more income left to be invested in, 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 in management of the forest, namely reducing fuel accumulation in the understory. Of, of the forest. So this is a, a, a much more relevant dimension, the, the intensity of management than, than, than species selection by itself. And, and, and people who are convinced that uh, if we replaced eucalypts with some other species, the fire problem would be solved. I think they're barking up the wrong tree, literally. <laughs> literally. <clears throat> Very well, thank you. So, um, our last, I would like to to speak to to Enrique, our guest from Montes, with uh, and um, to that end. Um, so, what could you tell us? What area of Portugal is today, presently, is Montes most involved in? Why did you choose that area? And uh, what are your, you know? short future plans, immediate future plans. Mostly we, we, we manage land on, on the central Portugal. Uh, just because uh, we started there and, and there's opportunities there, but we, we moved uh, to wherever have a good opportunity. We, don't, we, we are not uh, uh, willing to be a, a regional or local organization. So. Um, it's just a question of uh, opportunity. Uh, whenever there are some land that nobody wants to, to, to manage, uh, our, our main goal, uh, we are a conservation uh, organization, but our main goal is not to protect the, the, uh, the highlights of um, biodiversity or something, the hotspots of biodiversity. Our main goal is to bring management to uh, those those lands that nobody's nobody wants to. Um, if 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 nobody is interested on that, it's there we 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 where we want to to be. Uh, if there are no social interest or economic interest in a, in a land, we 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 are convinced that it is possible to manage that to 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 create social value through biodiversity. So uh, if nobody wants it, if nobody is interested in that, uh, we want to get there and, and, and manage it to, to, to be uh, a most uh, interesting thing. So we are in, 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 in the center of Portugal near 200 hectares. We know we're not yet in the 200 hectares uh, of, of uh, land management and um, management of land, but uh, we are near that. It's a question of opportunity. Whenever we have uh, uh, money for that, or some, some, someone that uh, wants us to, to, to manage uh, land, um, we, only, we only have two, two main, um, two main um, next is yes, yes, two main. Um, Demands. Sorry? Demands. 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 Uh, at least 10 years of management. Because there, there's no, 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 no use in having less than that, and, and ten years is is, is is it's not long. And the other one is we have full control on management. The owner doesn't have a word to say about that after we take management. Uh, the owner can can discuss with us the 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 the, the framework where, where we can manage, and we can discuss with them. But. Uh, in a day-by-day -day management, it's not possible to have two heads uh, running with, with different uh, ideas. Uh, so this, this, those are the only two, 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 two demands we, we, we are, uh, we need to manage a, a land or something and, and, and the resources to do it, but uh, that can be a thing that we look for it after. But these two demands, which is, time to do something that can can be worth 
that can work. And 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 the other one is uh, we don't discuss uh, the day by day management. It's 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 with us. We 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 discuss the long term, the long term and the long term objectives. It's okay. But the day by day, it's impossible because whenever we want to make a fire or to bring grazing or something, uh, the, the owner would start to say, well, I don't think it's a good idea. My, my daughter and said that, uh, well, it's impossible to, to make uh, management on, on, on these conditions. Thank you so much. Uh, as you can see, we've already passed our time. Again, there are so many wonderful questions that unfortunately uh, cannot address. Um, we chose the, these panelists and this panel because we believe at the center that it is vital to have a, a continuous dialogue between this, the West Coast of the United States and the West Coast of Europe, and to also bring um, the, the, the public, the voice into the discussion so that it can be a collaborative effort towards solving something that is uh, so upsetting to all of us. Every year, I think people now are sort of thinking, oh my God, fire season is coming on. Uh, so it, it, it is definitely a very important uh, as, aspect, a very important problem that our areas share. I am very grateful for your agreeing to participate and taking time out of your very busy lives. I, I know we're over overwhelmed with Zooms uh, we seem to be doing a lot more events now than we ever did. Uh, so I appreciate that very much. I appreciate all of the all of the people who uh, tuned in and listened to our talk. And um, I continued, I wish you continued success in solving these problems and in working together. And in a parting word, uh, if anybody is so inclined as to donate to Monty's, which who survives on uh, whatever we do for them. I would ask uh, Eric to please uh, publish in the chat the link where people can uh, go and donate. They have PayPal. Isn't that right, Eric? Yes, yes, we have <laughs> every, everything to collect money we have. Yeah, yeah, I think I made you do that a few years back, if I yes, remember correctly. Yes, you did it after, after It's the all finals. my fault. Yes, it. <laughs> in any event, it, it um, it, it is a very worthy cause. So if anyone would like to do that, I know this is big given, I'm supposed to be asking for money for Cal, but well, but you know, it's a little bit one way, a little bit the other way. So thank you so very much and have a wonderful day. And please continue to tune in as we continue our series of bilateral research in very important uh, areas uh, to all of us. Uh, thank you, Professor Gillis. Thank you, Professor Cardozo, and thank you, Enrique, uh, for your uh, participation. And thank you, all of you, and have a good thank rest of the all. day. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I